Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And, uh, I should have been reading the first book of the, uh, uh, Anthony Trollope series that I'm supposed to be reading, uh, The Palisers, but that book is 800 pages long, and I suspect the rest of the books in that, uh, particular, uh, se sextology? Heptology? I, I don't, I don't do Greek thing. Anyways, um, I, I am expecting that those are going to take a while to get through, so I have yet another 300 pages to go on that book, so we are doing Edward Eager's Tales of Magic, Magic or Not. Uh, now, the interesting, I'm going to state for the record first that whoever did this is clearly inspired by whoever did the covers for old doll books, and they should be ashamed of themselves because that is horrible. This is a horrible cover, and I hate it. Um, but that's the ebook cover of the copy that I had available to me, and I didn't feel like going to the effort of trying to track down uh, one that was actually properly published in 59 or whatever, basically when the book was actually published originally. So let's move on to the interior title page because that is less aggravating because we have moved on to the illustrations by N.M. Bodecker, whoever that might be. Um, so Magic or Not is an interesting little book. The first book by Edward Eager that I read actually was Half Magic, which I will do eventually, but that's part of an at minimum trilogy with some weird hyper-temporal cross-universal cross-jumping things happening in it. So uh, we'll get to that when we get to it. But that one is actually magic, whereas this one it isn't until the second last chapter that you even get to anything that could be definably termed as paranormal, supernatural, what have you. So the story of this book is uh, a brother and sister. Here we have here pictured the sister, Laura, and James are uh, city kids. Uh, this is taking place in the 1950s, uh, contemporaneous to the year of publication, one assumes. Um, they have moved to the country, their family has moved to the country, and when they get there, uh, well, on the train ride there, they first meet Lydia, who is a girl who is native to the town that they're moving to, and who, when they first meet, sort of deliberately goes for broke and trying to be weird and esoteric and exotic and exciting and dangerous and other things. And Lydia Green uh, tells uh, James and Laura that her grandmother is a witch and that there's an old wishing well in the front yard of the house that they're moving into. Um, and, you know, if you want to, and if you, you know, put a piece of paper in there or something, that you'll get a wish. And, uh, you, you know, if you send a wish down the well, it'll make it come true, and so on and so forth. And,. Laura and James debate this a little bit, and Laura decides, sort of on the spur of the moment, to toss a wish down there, and her wish, and I'm just, this isn't really hugely important, it's just something that I'm throwing out there because I kind of, I kind of enjoy the thought process there, where she wishes for a kitten because she, what she's thinking is, there are so many ways in so many stories where wishes go wrong. You know, it's like the Sybil who wished to live forever and wound up living forever, but she forgot to wish for eternal youth, so she became smaller and smaller and wound up, you know, shrinking and shriveling up and being a gazillion years old and living in a bottle because, well, you know, that's what happens when you live forever, but don't actually get to also, you know, maintain your youth while doing so. So, rather than, you know, making some kind of wish that might go wrong, she wishes for something small and compact and easy and simple that theoretically not much could go wrong with it. And then the next morning... Uh, there are two kittens there, except it turns out that Lydia 
dropped off two kittens in order to convince them that the well was actually real. And then they go and burn a... and uh, they sort of challenge Lydia on the magic thing, and she tells them that there's a thing called Rabbit's Bane, and if you burn it, it will call a being from another world, at which point she is questioned whether it would be, like, a fairy or, you know, space aliens, and she shrugs and doesn't know, and that's, I would like to state for the record, the kind of thing that means that you shouldn't be burning it, because if you don't know what kind of visitor is going to be called, that's the stuff that horror films are made out of. Or, you know, uh, Slender Man stuff is made out of, because that's part of the Slender Man lore from one of the games. Anyways, so the thing is that this all starts off uh, they burn it, and there's supposed to be a visitor from another world or something, and they find a tree in the middle of their lawn the next day, and it turns out that this boy, Kip, who is the fourth member of their party, um, planted a tree in the middle of their yard in a desperate bid to sort of continue things to keep the idea of magic going, and everybody's sort of very disappointed with everyone else for trying to trick everybody, and... Kip, it seems, from our omniscient narrator, was actually just trying to shore up Lydia's reputation, that he was trying to be nice, actually. But anyways. And then a woman... Uh, this is, of course, Lydia meeting them after the cats, of, after she... sort of the morning after uh, they she dropped off the kittens. Anyways, a woman in a coach, in, in a carriage, shows up, and this is 1959. We are in rural, semi-rural America. And a woman dressed like that in 1959 shows up um, with, you know, a horse-drawn carriage talking about the good old days and how, and how, yes, she was from another time, which might as well have been another world because, you know, the past is a foreign country, yada yada. And the kids decide that the magic did, in fact, work because they have, from a certain point of view, uh, received a visitor from another world. And that's sort of where the rest of the book goes. They keep on having these ideas that we're going to sort of do something to help people or the magic wants us to do things or to help things or what have you. And you know, they wind up reuniting the long-lost heir with his parents. Well, I mean, if they had taken the two-year-old child to a police officer after they found him sitting alone in the drugstore for 20 minutes, uh, that might not have been an issue. They instead dragged him all over the place, but the child wasn't hurt by his little adventure and seemed to have had a great time. Um, you know, and they wind up having a series of adventures that are kind of like that, that if you Obi-Wan Kenobi it and say from a certain point of view, yes, the wish came true, yes, the thing that we asked for happened, but from another perspective, you went and harassed a banker in his home until he decided to not drive poor Isabella King out of her home? Uh, and at the very end, when and their second last adventure, when they are trying to make sure that a new school can be built for the town where it was projected to be built, uh, they manage to, by just by being nice to one woman's son, uh, that son manages to effectively convince the woman to change her mind on it, and since she is a bellwether for a large portion of the town, a whole bunch of people who would have voted against that school being built where it was to be built because she didn't want it there, uh, they voted in accordance with her when she said, yes, I guess we should put it there. Um, and it's a very, very weird little book. The only point where you get... where you get the actual intimation of real magic is right at the very end of the book when the children are visited by a ghost. However, at the end they start to wonder if maybe that wasn't magic. If 
you know, and they start to go through all of the people that they know, um, and they wind up deciding that they're going to believe it's magic because there was too much, there, there were too many moving pieces in that for it not to have been externally forced. You see, at the very end, they found a letter indicating that if they bring these two ancient desks together, uh, these two hundred-year-old desks together in moonlight, uh, that, uh, you know, somebody's heart's desire will be found. And they bring the two desks together because the two desks were apparently desks by that were owned by two cousins um, who shared a first name and a middle name, but the first one was... Uh, Oh, come on. <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, never take notes, never pay attention to stuff, so I'm... I'm kind of having to look things up on the fly. As I do, you may have noticed frequently that you hear me flipping pages on this. Um... Uh, on, on my channel, but anyways, so... You have, uh... They find this desk that uh, was supposed to, um, as I said, that it was supposed to be found and uh, and and put together. And here we go. Alas, that one of two should roam afar from friendship's childhood home. Let him who finds in friendship's name restore the truant whence it came, and he who makes these twain be one. If it be done by light of sun, I wish him joy upon the well from joyless and Mehitabel. But if it be by shine of moon, then may he may gain a special boon. My ghost shall grant his wish entire, and he shall have his heart's desire. Um, and so it's Anne Mehitabel and Mehitabel Anne, uh, two girls who have almost the same name, and the ghost appears and talks to them and and theoretically grants their heart's desire. Um, and again, this is one of those from a certain point of view, because for example, they've added a fifth by the end of it, the wealthy, annoying woman's son, who they had sort of sneered at at the start of that chapter, who had turned out to be a perfectly nice guy who just isn't very well socialized because his mother is constantly sending him away to incredibly ghastly boarding schools. And and he got his heart's desire. One can tell it is deeply implicit at the end of the book that he got his heart's desire of having actual friends of his own age to hang out with. Anyway, um, I do really like these interior illustrations, by the way. They're really, really nice. I just, I like this so much. Um, it's like, this is wonderfully moody and evocative and... It makes me hate the cover all the more. Because, uh, I mean, these are great. Look at that. Look at that first picture. Isn't that beautiful? That is gorgeous. And just such a wonderful implication about, you know, just magical surroundings and everything. And the lady in the carriage. And anyways. So, um... So we find out that Gordy's gotten his heart's desire, which is friends, and one presumes that all the others got something that could arguably be their heart's desire out of the event, not least of which having something happen that was clearly and definably magic, because, again, as I said, they, at the end of it, they determined there are just far too many moving parts for it to have been predicted, for this to have been some kind of, of, uh, uh, scheme by the adults in their lives to give them a magical summer. Anyways, so the question on of the title is valid, and yet there's a lot in here that remains a whole lot of Obi-Wan Kenobiing of from a certain point of view. Uh, so now that I've given you that completely incoherent story summary and commentary, 
Um, I leave everyone to whatever they want to do next, and I will see you all next week.